So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for registering for this webinar on distributed antenna systems or DAS. Um, you should all be joined in listen only mode, so your microphones will be muted. Um, please use the questions pane on your screen um, to bring to our attention if you're having any issues with the presentation, and we will have, have an opportunity for questions at, at the end. My name's Kelvin Law. I'm a Sinclair's Director of Sales for Europe, Middle East and Africa. My colleague Stefan Lavriv will be making the main presentation. And uh, to introduce uh, Stefan to those of you that, that haven't had the priv privilege of meeting him, Stefan was born in Sarajevo, the former Yugoslavia, today's Bosnia and Herzegovina. He built his first antenna at the age of 12 uh, in 1972 for shortwave AM radios and built his first germanium radio detector receiver at the same age and an AM transmitter two years later. And then uh, in 1975, received his ham Morse code radio license. So he's a died in the wool radio man. He completed his engineering degree at the University of Sarajevo Faculty of Electrical Engineering with a major in radio communications and started his telecom career in 1986, working on telemetry and two-way radio systems for the gas and mining industry in Yugoslavia. He then immigrated to Canada in 1995 and worked mainly for cellular operators in Canada, the US, Australia, New Zealand and the UK, and he specialised in distributed antenna systems. Stefan then joined Sinclair in April 2019 as an RF system engineer, working on expanding Sinclair's product line into DAS components and systems in the UHF and VHF bands and filling the gap in the inbuilding DAS industry that includes emergency services, public safety radio comms, maintenance, construction, mining, te tele telemetry communications, and everywhere there's an indoor requirement for VHF and UHF. Now, as you've all been specifically invited, I think it's reasonable, oh, next slide please, Stefan. As you've all been specifically invited, I think it's reasonable to assume you all know at least a little about Sinclair's long history in the radio comms industry. We were founded in 1951 by Dr. George Sinclair, and we've built an industry leading reputation for high quality and reliable antennas and RF conditioning products that function well in extreme environments. And we've now added a portfolio of DAS components to our offering. Next slide, please, Stefan. So Stefan will start with a refresher of DAS essentials to make sure that we're all on the same page before taking us through the important points to consider when designing a DAS system before highlighting our DAS offering. And of course, we will finish with an opportunity for you all to ask any questions. There'll also be some post webinar polls, which will allow us to take your feedback and to help us tailor future sessions to meet your requirements. So now I'll hand you over to Stefan. Thank you, Stefan. Good afternoon, everyone. One more time from Canada. And I want to, after the introduction of myself, I would like to uh, take you through the basic of distributed antenna systems. And I started in the cellular telephone industry in 1998. I started with first DAS learning about DAS going to Europe where DAS for GSM was already uh, more implemented than the, those uh, uh, IIR conferences which talk about DASs. If any one of you remembers those, since if I say I know how GSM works, they know my age. <laughs> So basically, uh, the the Sinclair Technologies got involved in the DAS through the um, way of VHF UHF, which uh, was not present in the DASs. The cellular companies don't get there, and uh, the VHF UHF going up to 700, 800 for emergency services expanded, and uh, those services start to have rise of expectation. That's the major driver for lower frequency DAS systems. So the firefighter or police officer expect that his two-way radio works same as cell phone. Basically, very simple as that. And distributed antenna system is a way how to achieve that. So distributed antenna system have one or multiple sources of radio frequency signal, which is which is simultaneously transmitted through the several antennas, two, three, four, or more. So why to, to bother with distributed antenna system is same like why to bother with the 
airplane which has every row, every seat has speaker inside, above, right? And uh, isn't it easier just for a flight attendant to scream or to take megaphone and scream the instructions? Well, that's good for a mid middle seats, but all the way on the end, you won't hear it. And uh, all the way on the front, it will be too loud. So distributed antenna systems exactly that distribute the signal evenly through the building so everybody has good uh, quality and good signal level to get very good reception. So, so going from there, which kind of DAS exist? Exist indoor and outdoor uh, DASs. Distributed antenna systems uh, are mainly designed for indoor. Majority of them are in the buildings Although close to airports, where is a restriction on the height of your towers, you are unable to put one taller tower, let's say 10 meters or above, it's hard to get a permit to put, then you put distributed antenna system on utility poles, which are already there. I did a design for those uh, as well, since in North America, the the fiber is already on utility poles which helps a lot you need just to bring the power utility poles have 10 kilovolts or more so you need to have transformer going down to 110 and then you put your remote power from there uh, next uh, division of um, distributed antenna system is active and passive and mix of that. You have active, passive, and uh, hybrid. Let's call it hybrid. Uh, active systems are that each antenna is driven by its own transmitter. That define active distributed antenna system. So fiber, uh, by fiber signal or information, in this case, which can be speech, it can be data, it can be anything, is uh, brought to the remote and the remote converts light to RF and RF get transmitted to the antenna. Passive system have a one single source which is base station or repeater or bi-directional amplifier or even remote, could be remote of the active system and then splits the signal to the several antennas, two or more. So hybrid will be active plus passive as I just mentioned. So you put the uh, active source with the uh, several, I will show that the uh, configuration a little bit later uh, when you have uh, several active sources through the building and then you put several antennas for each of those, uh, of those sources to distribute the signal through the, uh, the through the building. That's the most common way since it's a compromise between price and uh, and the complexity of antennas, way less points of failure, basically. You're more reliable that way if you have a, a active and passive system combined in hybrid system. As a RF source, I mentioned bi-directional amplifier, very often used, that's the very common in industrial application in uh, uh, emergency services, repeater, Again, it's uh, very commonly used in a large industrial complex, which are uh, one of the main targets of our industry, since though that kind of industry is very, very abandoned and not paid attention to from anybody, since uh, carriers usually pay for DAS. But who pays for repeater and DAS inside, uh, let's say, plant? any plant, which has several buildings, which are metal, basically, usually metal uh, structures, and from one to another signal just can't penetrate since Faraday cage. Uh, starting there, uh, local communication can be complemented with a cell phone, since cell phone doesn't work very well in those kind of environments either. So you may have a combined system which carry, let's say, VHF or UHF or both, plus cell phone on 900 megahertz. Uh, as a uh, base station, as RF source, I put here just to complete the list. 
Although in uh, industrial application, base stations is very rare. There is no base stations. And uh, in the industrial application, if you have simplex walkie-talkie and say, hey, I can't reach another guy, another building, the manufacturer say, okay, we will sell you another thing which called a repeater, and then you will, should be better. Well, is it better? Yes, it is better, but still can't reach everyone everywhere. And expectation, the rise of expectation, again, will get you back to the distributed antenna systems to get everyone everywhere in any time. So for uh, going to the deeper in DAS components and active and passive DAS components, uh, we have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, in active DAS components, the remotes. So remote get uh, uh, energy locally, usually, although it can be supplied from head end. And active components, uh, active components are head end, as I mentioned, RF source, of that the first thing from where the signal is coming. It could be BDA as well. It comes to RF uh, head end, which collects all those RF sources in one point and then distributed the remotes via fiber. It could be uh, uh, accompanied with the copper and then distributed to antennas. So you have passive dust components, which I didn't mention so far, which contains antennas, of course, you need that to transmit your RF energy. And then you have splitters. Splitter is device which uh, divide energy from one input to several output, could be two, three, four, or more. Those splitters usually divide, uh, the output is evenly spread. So if you have, uh, um, let's say, one watt in input, two-way splitter will be half and half minus insertion loss. 50-50%. If you have four-way splitter, it will be quarter of the power on each output. And then it comes directional couplers. Directional couplers are uneven splitters. And uneven splitters are dividing energy uh, by... Uh, quarter of energy will go in the couple side and the rest of the energy will go directly. That's very important when you distribute the, the, the signal not to, for the first speaker not to be too loud. If you remember analogy with airplane, the, if you put everything evenly, then the, the power which should go to the last seat will be the lowest one. And to prevent that, you need an even split of uh, of energy i will get back to directional couplers later a little bit since uh, very often you will find something called tupper and tupper is way cheaper and uh, many people is um, convinced to buy tuppers and i will talk a little bit more what is the difference between coupler and, and tupper since they unevenly split energy but they have advantages and disadvantages i will talk about it, the advantage is the price, disadvantage is isolation between ports. So when you design your <clears throat> your distributed antenna system, what you have to know? Well, first you have to know what you're supposed to cover exactly. And that never happened to me that I know exactly what I need to cover un un until I get there. Since on the floor plans, uh, even a building owner will highlight which area he wants to cover and then comes other people along like chief of maintenance he said hey i don't have a coverage in my back office and i'm on the second floor below how come you are covering everything else but you are not covering my floor so those kinds of conflicts very often happen and uh, you have to find that before you start designing to to know what to do in a case that uh, there is more changes to the uh, to the uh, initial target coverage area. So target coverage area will be determined by uh, signal level, target signal level. So if you want to have neg 95 dBm everywhere, what everywhere means, you have to plot it on a on a plot, or it is all entire surface of the building, but doesn't include elevators. Or you give a margin of five percent. That five percent you are allowing to have less coverage. 
to to save some money as well, you can uh, record the existing signal level from outside and say, hey, I have just several spots where I need the coverage and for the rest, it's already covered from outside. You have to know that before you start to, uh, to do your design. Of course, you have to know what is your target signal quality, target signal strength, uh, target PIM of your DAS as well, which if it is required at all, depends of the of the technology you are using. Uh, interference, which kind of interference, uh, noise levels, uh, the DAS have usually, active DAS have the highest noise level from all of them since they are active. So each amplifier, every amplifier is noise generator basically, on top of thermal noise generated on cables and splitters and other devices. From there, when you know your coverage area, when you know how far they are, what is the signal level, you will make the decision and uh, it will be defined even before start designing, it will be active or passive does, depends how many services. Do you design for cell phones and emergency services and VHF and UHF, or it is just one or two, or the size is too big, like several buildings or stadium? How big is the target area you will get from there? And you, as designer, have to think about expansion and upgrade. Maybe later on will come another carrier with another demand of the power, and the power is commonly shared between carriers. So you have to have three or more dB margin, <clears throat> even six, that you can always add more power on your remotes, uh, or if it is a if it is active system, or if it is passive system, you have to add as well uh, some uh, margin over there. So you always have enough power to maintain the coverage as per uh, uh, per target targeted uh, values on the beginning uh, you have uh, as along the design the best way is to visit every single antenna location every single remote location if you have remotes to know uh, what should be maintenance requirement for those when you design it don't put it in some place where they need three days to get there somewhere high above i had the casinos which you will need escort and you need special maintenance people to to put to install temporary ladders to get to your remote so it takes you two days just to get get there, but it happens, especially in the older building. It's uh, hard to find good location, which is not obstructive, it's not bothering anyone. Uh, I have highlighted one red item, isolation between donor and serving antenna. That's the most important parameter for you designing with the bidirectional amplifier. Bidirectional amplifier is basically Amplifier, which amplify both directions. Simple word, the description tells you everything what you have to know. But what is the problem with the PA system? If your microphone gets too close to speaker, you have that sound, which is oscillation. So what that's a positive feedback, which makes amplifier oscillating. How you get rid of it? you put microphone and speaker further apart or behind each other. That is increasing isolation between uh, between source and source is microphone and the speaker, which is antenna, you have to spread them apart. In this case, your microphone is donor antenna on top of the building, which received the signal. BDA is amplifier, by direction amplifier, and then you have a speaker which is serving antenna, but you have multiple serving antenna, but you know which antenna has the, this, the closest to the uh, donor antenna, which may cause majority of the problems. So you have to investigate and be sure that you have enough isolation. So what is enough? Enough is that your, your uh, uh, BDA gain has to be 20 dB lower than your isolation. 
or isolation has to be 20 dB better. For example, you have to have 100 dB of isolation if you have 80 dB amplifier, which is majority of the cases, uh, situation 80, 70, I did see it going down to 50, but those 50 dB amplifiers are useless. You need very strong signal, like if you have theoretically 0 dBm input of your output, you have 50 out. Well, neg 50, you will get 0. Well, neg 50 is very strong signal on the rooftop, then you even don't need amplifier anymore inside the building, or maybe if it is metal. So there are some small applications for a low gain amplifier as a 50, 60 dB, but they are not very, uh, very good. And they are not very good uh, in uh, uh, automatic gain control. That's another parameter which we're supposed to talk about is automatic gain control. Just one sentence, don't rely on automatic gain control since it will kill your gain, uh, your, uh, amplification factor or how much is amplification. If you have a feedback, it will detect the feedback and then decrease the gain. If you decrease the gain, what you lose, you lose the power. So don't rely on it. Well, well let's continue with this list of the consideration for distributed antenna system is maintenance as well. So maintenance, as I said, everything has to be easily access accessible, especially if you have remotes. Alarm. All active systems have a alarming. Passive systems don't have alarming, but it is possible there are ways how to alarm a certain, a certain, and I'm working on that to passive antenna to have some kind of alarming if your antenna is missing. None of those components so far don't have uh, ability to report missing antenna. Uh, due to uh, VSWR, won't change too much if you cut off one antenna. It is very small after all those splitters and couplers, small change to measure it. So now some companies invented the smart splitters and smart couplers which measure each port separately and then report if you have a bad SWR on one of the ports. That's uh, going in good direction, only problem is it's very expensive to get it with the, let's say, 50 antennas. Next thing to consider, especially for emergency services, is backup power. Uh, here in North America, uh, backup power is very defined by local counties. In Europe, is also defined how many hours the, the DAS is supposed to work before after cutting the power before it dies out. So sometimes it's one hour, two hour, some requirements mentioned 24 hours. That's a more or less locally country defined value. <clears throat> and we, we are getting now into regulation part. So although the, the power is important, but there is another requirements for your cables to be fire retardant and fire resistant, another safety code for uh, water penetration. Uh, for example, if you are designing dust to cover the parking, it has to have some kind of uh, uh, IP65 or the, the enclosure of your remote has to have some kind of water protection as well. Here is the example. <clears throat> I'm go going back to the hybrid DAS. Here is the, the the schematics of one typical hybrid DAS. Why it's hybrid? I will show you that with my uh, pointer now. A hybrid portion of that is this is the passive portion, and active portion is this portion. So this is a hybrid DAS because it has passive portion and active portion. So if we have here only one antenna, it will be only one active DAS. And as a sources, which I already, it's base station, mini cells, micro micro cells, repeaters, bidirectional amplifier could be uh, all kind of thing. Even carrier wave generator for testing purposes, it's a good source to check your, your coverage. 
So master unit condition all those RF cables, which usually have multiple cables coming in the in the unit, which converts. It has several card and several slots, which converts this to the fiber. Fiber can go directly to remote if you have up to sometime eight, up to 16. Remote can be directly connected to remote. A remote unit can be connected directly to master unit. You don't need to this expansion units. But in case that you have more remote units than eight or sixteen, then you need one or more of these expansion units, which basically divide the signal further away to to connect more remote units. Remote units finally convert this to the RF and combine all those RF, there is multiple cards here inside remote units for 900 megahertz band, for 1900, megahertz band, or lower to VHF, UHF, and that creates a little bit of confusion for people. Here, I put only one cable. If you'd combine with the multiband captor, all your signal and you can feed all those antennas it can work i agree absolutely so if you have antenna which covers vhf uhf up to 1900 here we go you don't need anything this will work perfectly for you what is bad about this is that your coverage on the lower frequency will be way better than on the higher frequencies due to multiple reasons Radio waves propagate uh, and attenuate to the free space loss different on different frequencies. So your range of uh, different frequency will be different. But here you have same amount of power transmitting. To, and uh, it's harder to find components which can cover all cellular bands going to 2500, including VHF, UHF. So usually this part gets split in uh, uh, in uh, in several outputs, which is the lower frequencies, VHF, UHF, and 700, 800, 900, and the rest of the frequency goes to the separate system. So they have two separate antennas, since you don't need so many antennas as if you higher go for higher on the frequencies. What is the, this is perfect for large venues, like stadiums, like, uh, uh, college campuses, universities, very nice to cover a lot of space, a lot of square meters. Easy to sectorize, that's for cellular telephone business. Since this master unit uh, can get multiple sectors from base station and then get sector toward the remote, sep you can even reconfigure later easily removing this uh, uh, cable from this one. Uh, to this one and you get on a sector, you can increase or decrease the size of the sectors, which is very common and very often in the mobile phone carriers. But for, uh, uh, for our purposes, we will talk about uh, just advantages, disadvantages of the, as a hardware, as a hard piece of hardware. Disadvantage is uh, backup. You need to backup each of these units to be able to sustain two hours or four hours. Those backup units have to be maintained every year. I use the word class job. I work for American Tower Corporation. Every year they go and change the batteries of the remotes. That's a lot of batteries and a lot of price. You need the multiple backup systems for each unit, or you can go along with the fiber and the fiber and copper together and then power it from master unit, uh, from head end or master unit, that's possible as well. There are several examples for those, but um, depends of the configuration and depends of the design. I did see both. Uh, some of the owners like to have centralized, some of them likes to have a separate, since if one backup or one unit fails down, the rest of the system still works, which is true and useful. So it's prone to faults especially in uh, remote units and expansion units. That casino I was talking about before is a typical example since uh, rem uh, remote units were above the ceiling and it's getting hot there, about 40 degrees Celsius, 45, and then uh, power supply fails. And then you, you are 
you have to send technician to go above the ceiling, find that unit and replace the power supply, which happens once every two years. So now I'm back to the passive dust systems. You can see that it's the same picture from the previous slide, only the RF source is here, which is base station again, remote unit, repeater, bidirectional amplifier, and has several components. Benefit of it is that you have one backup only and single power supply to fail. Easy to backup. Our disadvantage is that this has usually low power between 100 milliwatts up to 10 watts. I did see 10 watts. 5 watts, if you are lucky, you can get 10 watts, but 5 watts is depends on the source. It could be BTS, then you have 40 dBMs easily. Yeah. Uh, Advantage of uh, disadvantage of this uh, passive system is the limited bands and technology since you have to have several sources to combine. So you need the duplexers or you have multiband couplers to combine all those uh, services in uh, one above another to, uh, to the system and distribute it. So you have a lot of uh, insertion loss, but it's possible to do it. I did up to eight, build, eight floors building, but I did only one technology, 1900 GSM. I did those very popular, they were very popular, and 900 GSM that you can distribute with one passive system without uh, any active components. So what are components of a passive system? So signal source, we did talk about the splitters, which splits these tappers. Uh, tappers I didn't put here since cellular telephone operator don't like tappers. So why why is that? I will show you in the next slide, I think. Uh, I have it somewhere nicely pictured. Uh, couplers, which are directional couplers, as I said, uh, they have a coupling value, which is at state. 10 dB or uh, let's say 10 dB. So you have 30 dB coming from your BDA or source. You subtract 10 dB on this device, you get um, only 10 dBm signal here on this antenna. That's 10 milliwatts. The rest, which will be less than one dB attenuated goes to this splitter, could be far away and you allow more uh, uh, losses. On the end are antennas and you have a coaxial cables. I will uh, uh, stop here uh, telling you a little bit about uh, connecting coaxial cables since people use different cables for different purposes and there are high loss cheap ones and, high, and low loss very expensive ones. So my uh, advice is as longer you go, go with the more expensive cable since you have way less loss. LMR 400 is very commonly used, but there is LDF 4, for example, or its own in-building uh, variant. That good uh, cable as well to use, and it has a very low, those are Heliax cables, which have uh, more air than plastic inside. They are very good to with a very low insertion loss. Then you can use a jumpers if this is a, uh, let's say two meters, you can easily uh, put the jumper, which is already prefabricated. You don't need to run, uh, run uh, separate and reconnect everything. So th th those uh, uh, those values of the loss influence the final link budget analysis, but it's uh, workable that even with those losses, you get uh, cheaper but you get less power out. And that less power out, let's say you lose one dB or half dB, which is not big deal. Here in this, uh, this slide, I'm trying to compare how professional mobile radio, which I was talking about, VHF, UHF, all to nine, 900, uh, works uh, on DAS systems and what is the uh, trade-offs and advantages. So, Frequencies are different from 900 up to 2500 megahertz with tendency to go all the way to 5 gig with 5G with uh, also private LTE networks, which are now announced and uh, it will happen. So many industrial application 
will use one of those high frequency, three gig or going four or five gig for private LTE network. Why is that important? In that case, you will have terminals or um, uh, much more terminals, much higher communication, much more automation inside the factory. And that's one of the aspects uh, going forward with the uh, 5G to get into industrial applications and industrial, a lot of sensors, a lot of information to process but it gives advantage that you have an instantaneous uh, cut of the systems and you can reprogram it in a milliseconds. Uh, professional mobile radio using analog FM, digital TDMA, as a private LTE or L LTE uh, modulation, uh, modulation for uh, uh, for distributing the signal, all data here, voice or or data could be with the LTE, although this is very low frequency, so it, the, the throughput won't be very high, but it's possible to do. On the cellular band, you have GSM, UMTS, which are already obsolete, 4G, 5G coming up. And the bandwidth, it starts with 12.5 kilohertz, 25, all channel spacing and more than 100 if you go with the with digital communication, you need more bandwidth. So that sources for a personal, a professional mobile radio, usual base station are very rare. It's, it's hard to find, but BDA and repeaters are uh, <clears throat> are very common. And in a cellular telephone business, BDAs are gone. It's very hard to find BDA, especially now in 4G. BDA are not very good. There is no MIMO options. There is no, uh, the, the throughput goes down anytime you, you throw the signal through the amplifier and the noise rise. And the sensitivity to, uh, to passive intermod products uh, are, or, Vulnerability is a higher with the BDAs due to whoever takes BDA, try heavy tension to do it as cheaper as possible way, and that way harming the, the PIM rating of the system, which get transferred back to the base station. So that system advantage, disadvantages on the uh, professional mobile radio, you have lower path loss, which I mentioned already, due to lower frequencies. But on the uh, you have larger bandwidth with the cellular telephone for uh, for throughput, and uh, uh, you need a higher power to cover same square uh, square meter area. On the professional mobile radio lower frequencies, you have co a lower cable losses compared to 1900 or higher frequencies, lower body loss, lower pin vulnerability since the 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 channel width is narrower, so it's a harder to hit with intermod product. So on the bottom line is that uh, a public mobile radio needs less antennas per square meter, and that's uh, that's very important if you doing any industrial application. Keep that in mind. I <clears throat> told you that uh, due to this single reason, you will have. Uh, uh, active system for lower frequencies with less antennas and the higher frequency will go with more co uh, antennas and some of remotes won't have, won't need to have uh, distributed uh, that passive part. They will put just one antenna or or they will skip certain remotes altogether with the VHF or UHF. So, due to reasons above all this, BDA gains higher the uh, 70 dBs are feasible to compare with the DAS, uh, to complete DAS design. And here I mentioned already that BDAs are very negative, uh, uh, have a negative influence to the cellular telephone quality, since now everybody is transmitting on same channel anyway, so every BDA, every BDA will contribute to more noise. If we go further down the list, 
you have on the lower noise floor on the lower frequencies since the uh, narrow band transmissions especially if you have only voice and a walkie-talkie system your your mobile receiver sensitivity goes uh, uh, lower than neg 95 dBm it goes neg 100 easily neg one even all the way to 110 dBm my highest I ever achieved was neg 110 dBm on the other hand, higher mobile auto power, that's very important, and it comes to the, those topper uh, story about topper and couplers. Uh, since mobile radio have a higher power, one watt or five watts, up to five watt, I did see mobile talkie walkie with five watt auto power, uplink signal toward the base station is much stronger. And then topper may be used you allow the signal to spread and dissipate in uh, other antennas, but you still have enough to achieve a good uh, uplink, uh, uplink quality. And in that case, only in that case, you can use toppers. But if you have a mobile phone which is, has 0 0.2 watts maximum output power, then you have to squeeze every dB you can and save it. So instead of using toppers, in this case, you have to use uh, directional coupler for uplink that way the signal will be directed to the base station or bda uh, and not it was lost less loss in the uh, dust system in uh, another bad thing about lower frequencies antennas are way bigger and harder to install so for dust especially for dust aesthetical pleasing is very important otherwise you won't never get pass through the uh, uh, aesthetics of the buildings. To keep aesthetic of the building, we have to even hide the, behind the wall the, the, the antennas. And in many cases, I did work with antennas, which has to be above the ceiling, if the ceiling have a space to put it. So you have to work with the instruction people to find out where you can put the, the, the antenna you need more antenna since you have obstacles and uh, those antennas are bigger so for uh, for cellular band antennas are way smaller easier to install you can put it on a wall you can put it on a ceiling tile you can put above the ceiling easily it's much easier to work with uh, <clears throat> The, the professional services on VHF, UHF requires rooftop space. Well, these guys sell, or if they use BDA, which I said, it's very rare now, they do need rooftop space as well, but uh, due to the size of the, of the antennas, you need way more roof space, uh, especially in the case that your donor signal is very low, like, let's say, neg. 80s between neg 80 and neg 90 you are pretty low on donor signal so you need antenna with very high gain minimum 10 dbis even more if you can achieve neg 15 17 you are very good to 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 obtain on your after application of 70 to 80 db you are still able to get a good signal to distribute through your uh, passive dust Another thing which you have to consider is isolation concern between donor and serving antenna. Since um, uh, these cellular don't have BDAs too much, I didn't put them there. You don't, they don't need to, to care about that. If you go for a, a fire or ambulance or those uh, kind of services, there are some regulations which you have to uh, obey while designing and constructing the distributed antenna system. I put here NFPA 72, NFPA 1221 in the United States. We have fire, international fire codes, and uh, we have so many rules which you have to, to go through and uh, uh, obey the laws to be accepted as, a, as a emergency services uh, an, a, a distributed antenna system. The cellular telephone service is privately owned, so they have their own set of rules, which are uh, depend of the service provider between each other. 
and they really don't don't care about uh, uh, about NFPA rules and other regulations, except that you, they have to to have FCC rules, which are still in the same band. Since you, if you are in the, if you are making any troubles, you are making uh, troubles to yourself. So now I want to <clears throat> to show the system, which uh, is very common. And I mentioned all this already, just I want to put it together now. So this is distributed antenna system, still active one, which has a professional mobile radio and cellular together. So what is the problem here? If this guy wants to change this sector to from here to here, which uh, cellular telephone operators very often do, especially in the stadiums, they have events, so they want to increase capacity, they put less antennas per sector to, to keep capacity or to transfer capacity from one area of the stadium to another one, they usually do that. And doing that, I, you don't like to affect your your emergency services which are read here. So how you do that? It's very hard to do and harder in active system, but it's possible and it's very elegant system. So here we follow the cable which goes to the master unit. So if uh, anything happens to these guys, these guys won't be affected, the emergency services won't be affected. But from there, we have a fiber, two separate fiber, one for emergency services, one for cell phone radio. It goes so far that the different providers, Vodafone have their own, or uh, T-Mobile has their own, so they can work independently from each other, absolutely uh, not affecting anyone else. And that's the beauty of uh, active antenna system, which always allowed uh, multiple fiber optic strains to be go to remote units, and you can go up to 16 i think that the thinnest one is 16 pairs so 16 pairs you can add a lot of services there and as they come along they have inside several cards as i mentioned before and they combine them in one one antenna system but here i put it differently due to all reasons mentioned before due to an radio wave propagation starting from there due to different body loss, due to different wall absorption, due to different reflection, refraction. Uh, it, uh, bottom line is you need less antennas for emergency, for lower frequencies, VHF, UHF, and 800 to 900 megahertz, and you put only one antenna. And you put three antennas for cellular telephone services. So this antenna will be bigger could be hidden somewhere, or you may put only two. But you have now ability to control how many antennas for remote units you have. So if you have a frequency band closer to each other, like VHF, UHF, or UHF 900, or any combination that you can work together, then you can put it together in one system and transmit to the one antenna and uh, everything above. 1900 or 1800 megahertz you you use another system you you have an option to combine those uh, those uh, uh, systems and on top of that you may have different uh, laws to obey and this system don't need to obey certain rules but this system has to obey some emergency radio installation like an fpa laws in US. So this system have been separately designed to accommodate those laws and but this one don't need to. And then altogether, although this all DAS looks more complicated, but it's cheaper to build, even with more since you you don't need to put uh, waterproofing on this one, but you have to put only on this antenna. And that's will bring way uh, Cost the way down. In a Pearson Airport in Toronto, I will tell you, I was participating in design of that system. They designed uh, two separate DAS system. It wasn't even like this. This one is a combination. As you can see, you share expansion unit between 
uh, emergency services and cellular telephone services. The, the Pearson Airport in Toronto have totally separate expansion unit and totally separate remote units. They are on different places, they are different power, they are built on different age as well. So the, the emergency services go together with air traffic control and the local uh, walkie-talkies between airline staff goes to the repeater and goes to one, 130 megahertz, 120 to 130 megahertz band, and uh, then VH, uh, VHF and UHF for maintenance of the people, baggage handlers, they have their own system. And then cellular telephone operators build new system, which is totally independent. They share same room, they share same power gener backup generator, they share same <clears throat> backup battery power uh, uh, batteries and that's about it everything else master unit is separate expansion units are separate and remote units are totally separate and antennas are of course totally separate because of that so if you go to the on the low frequencies to industrial vhf uhf internal communication network i put here few examples uh, where the where we can fit in as a Sinclair going into into DAS business. This is a, our good opportunity since this kind of industrial application. When you have one big building, then you have another building, then you have three buildings connected together. All these guys hardly can reach each other from here to there, barely with simplex. If you put antenna like repeater here, you are better off, but I don't believe you will still be able to uh, reach Mike, which is under a uh, drill machine, which is all made of, and inside the building, which is made of uh, aluminum. That won't work, it's pure Faraday cage. Same applies for this kind of facility. You see, we have two big buildings, 500 meters apart and you have another two buildings which are which radio wave from here has to go through and then reach uh, this guy over there if you put the repeater on the middle building you are better but you can do everything there are so many uh, metal working uh, uh, facilities which do big tanks which guys get inside the tank. That's another Faraday cage you have to go through. So it's very hard to, to reach everyone and you will need to. So the antennas will be way closer to each other to be able to penetrate all kinds of environments. This one is the easiest one. It's a warehouse uh, kind of environment. And here is one example of the warehouse, how you cover the warehouse. So you have a repeater here. Now, now notice I have a repeater which is, let's say, here. It has only antenna on top, and it has a splitter. So it gets one third of the power to the omni antenna. And then it has a couplers which uh, split antenna, uh, position antenna. It goes even underground. I have here basement storage, for example. So you put one antenna there to be, to be able to reach anybody here. You have this uh, office space, you put them as well, one antenna for them. Then you have panel antenna on the on the one of the walls reaching out toward the middle of the building. And then you have another one reaching this direction from this direction. And then you have this uh, middle one. So you have you are covering this central building very well. But what about this guy? Since you have your repeater already and transmitting outside, the antenna is on the roof, you can put the BDA here and take the signal from here, amplify it and distribute with a separate passive antenna system. That antenna system uh, will have very strong input signal since the distance from here to here is just a couple hundred meters or maybe 300 meters, let's say 500 meters, but that path loss will give with the Yagi antenna the signal inside uh, about neg 50 for sure. So if you have 70 dB gain amplifier, you will get 20 easy like that. 
Of course, since you are so close and you can use an Omni antenna with a higher gain, you get uh, even stronger, like, like 45 or 40. I did uh, achieve even from 40 to 50 easily on those kind of distances. And then you put another passive antenna distributed system inside. These uh, uh, passive components are getting cheaper and cheaper as more and more they are present in the market. So cell phone business did develop a lot of products. Now offering is higher, so the price goes down. So it's not so expensive anymore for owner of this kind of factory to create one repeater system, which they usually already have, and then distribute antenna system along the the other buildings to get the good coverage. Those are small small DASs for industrial purposes. It can be joined with uh, uh, with cell phone as well, since usually these kind of buildings don't have very good reception inside the building as well or for the cell phone service. So now I'm getting into Sinclair portfolio, so where we are over there. When I joined uh, Sinclair, I was working on uh, on cellular telephone uh, DASs mainly, but I did uh, go for s several in the United States for several uh, emergency services DASs as well. It's, as a donor antenna, I used to use Yagi. That's the only thing I know it exists. But when I start working here, I find out that we have, that there is parabolic reflector UHF NV and the corner VHF antenna. Those are perfect for bidirectional amplification. I didn't know even that they exist. I, I didn't know. Uh, I would use it if I knew, since it gives a very good front-to-back ratio. Isolation between donor and serving antennas are very good. So I, I like those antennas very much for uh, BDA application. So we have a serving antennas as well, as well which covers VHF, UHF, and higher frequencies. Uh, then we have directional couplers with uh, several coupling value starting from 6, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 dB coupling values, power splitters, crossband couplers, duplexers, and uh, pre-selectors. Those uh, devices can be used to get passive system easily up and running for the smaller, as the previous slide showed. Uh, uh, there is another bottom line here which says uh, custom combining filtering. And uh, this is very important if you have several channels to combine in one DAS. So it is on same band, let's say UHF, you have three channels which are supposed to work in same time. Simultaneously, you have to, to filter it and combine it together to the, uh, to the BDA or if you have three repeaters, for example, for three separate channels, for three separate services, maintenance, transport, et cetera. So that, those systems are very, uh, very necessary. Uh, the last one, I was designing one for nuclear plant. They have DAS already, but doesn't work very well, so they want to improve, they want to change it. And they have VHF, UHF, and 800, for example. <clears throat> Going deeper into components, there are several uh, antennas and donor an uh, donor antennas. I guess you are already familiar with the with the Sinclair offer of uh, all kind of uh, frequency band and all kind of gains, different uh, uh, shape and sizes of antenna, which are all low pin rated, which are already a robust antenna could be on the, the rooftop of any building, no matter of the climate. They are tested on the Canada. If it survives the Canadian North, it survives everything else. Serving antenna, that's the new portfolio. We have a low PIM rated, which have a 4310 mini DIN connector and N female connector. Those two connectors are available. And the frequency goes from 138 to 6 gigahertz. Those antennas can be used uh, for almost any kind of task, even in cell phone going up to 5G band, uh, up to mid middle 
5G band of 6 gigahertz. Uh, after, if you go further above, uh, there is no point of uh, using distributed antenna systems. And the losses in the cable and the space and the walls are so high that there is no point to have having uh, DAS for higher frequencies. So all carriers and all uh, contributors, starting from Ericsson, uh, on 5G arena are talking about uh, DASs which won't go above 6 gigahertz. Up to 6 gigahertz, yes, but above will be just a micro microwave links, basically. The, the distances will be direct from antenna to or from device to device, and uh, after that will be uh, the data will be transferred different way, not radio waves anymore. So thus splitters and couplers, to talk about that, I mentioned that, that between 6 and 30 dB coupling values. The, the advantage of that, if your signal, I was talking about the signal which comes from your mobile, comes here, let's say here, it's uh, coupled out, it gets split in this direction and that direction. This is input coming from repeater or from BDA. So the direction of that will be, uh, let's say this is 10 dB, it will be 10 dB less. But you have to add more 3 dB more on topper because it gets lost this way. Uh, but the isolation of this, these two ports, which is on one unwanted, it's not welcome, especially in cell phone business. It's a, a, 18, around 18, 16 to 18 dB between port to port isolation, which is very good. That's a 10 dB is a one tenth of the power you lose. But if you have uh, 18, that's uh, much, much higher than that. A very low percentage you lose in that direction. So majority of the power goes in this direction as desired. So link budget calculations are much stronger uplink signal than than using the toppers. And on top of that, you have less interference since the signal going out on the topper is interfering with the, some another users as well. Uh, splitter have a same story. Isolation between ports are always between 16 and 18 dB as well. Uh, those uh, uh, splitters have uh, mini DIN for 310 or N female connectors. You have PIM rated, non PIM rated. Uh, depends of your application. If you don't care too much about PIM, you have just a uh, uh, situation like two way radio on 12.5 megahertz with the uh, two channels. The probability to hit PIM is very, very low. So. I remember the time when we worked with GSM, we didn't even think about PIM. PIM wasn't important at all. We never calculated the PIM since uh, the channel was only 250 kilohertz wide and uh, you have your own channels and inter intermod products are so low that you we never didn't even experience uh, influence of PIM. But now PIM is getting as, a, even starting with 3G, start to be influential and the wider you go more influence you have if you have five megahertz signal and another five megahertz wide signal your pin will be 10 megahertz wide and spread along those 10 megahertz and you will hit somebody for sure i will give you example i was last year in morocco and uh, we did a system which uh, was designed for a two-way radio, digital one, and we had the uh, 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 sensitization of receiver. Receiver lost uh, sensibility, and I went there to investigate what what did go wrong. So when I got to the tower, I said, "Well, this is wrong." I didn't even touch any instrument. I knew what is wrong. I see TV transmitter which transmit 10 kilowatts next to our antenna, about 550 meter apart. Of course, those two, our control channel from digital radio and that TV signal will generate some kind of intermod. It could be 17 order of intermod, it will affect your receiver for sure. And of course, I was measuring, I getting neg 
95 dBm of intermode product between TV signal, which is 5 MHz wide, and the 12.5 MHz control channel, those two signals, when you combine them, when you interfere them, PIM is creating uh, the sensitization of the receiver. So even though we put the antenna separate, TXR antennas, it didn't work. So we had to remove antennas about 300 meters from that tower, build another small tower on the same hill and put antenna there. And then it did work. Okay, that was a little bit distracting. Let's go to the next uh, slide. So I was talking about uh, this custom filtering. I'm, I'm going back to it. It's very important for you to know that we can combine before getting into into uh, a distributed antenna system passive or active doesn't matter you have to combine those signals uh, to do custom filtering uh, which is designed and prefabricated for a certain channel frequencies so frequency has to be specified and uh, it can be duplexed it can be separate the xrx antenna i won't go too much to those details but it can be generated uh, custom to your needs and those needs are specified by number of channels frequencies exact frequencies and in that case we can create the custom system which will be very resistant to any kind of interference from outside especially if you join several services in 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 same system like for example you have your three channel and you have another guy five channel like pearson airport you have united airlines and air canada and delta and all the, those three companies they have their own uh, channels simplex channels to work with that would be all from me thank you very much for your attention and uh, i took a little bit longer than i expected about 10 minutes but i'm open for uh, questions if you have any go ahead and uh, i will try to my best knowledge to answer yeah please um please use the question facility on your on your panel on on your screen there to uh signal if you have a question please okay it looks at the moment if no one's got an immediate question what i'd like to do is we've just got a couple of um some polls here in order to um understand a little bit more about uh our audience and so on so i'll put each one up for perhaps less than a minute if you would be so kind um, to just respond to the poll and then we'll uh, move on to the next one so let's launch the first one which is asking about whether you usually design your own das system straightforward uh, straightforward yes or no um, so i'll give you uh, about 40 seconds or so to uh, just respond to that one please if you if you if you'd wish to just be helpful to uh, understand a little bit more about our audience we know all of you one way or another but it's helpful to know what you're doing there <clears throat> so it's quite interesting um, just looking at those results coming coming in slowly um, about two-thirds of you are subcontracting that work out to uh, other companies and uh, one third of you are actually doing your are, are actually doing your own um, especially if you're Especially if you are using IB Wave, then uh, doing three or four design doesn't pay the license. Yeah, that is one of the questions I'm going to ask, mm. actually. I'm going to poll, poll that one as well. Okay, that's great. Thank you for a response to that. So, yeah, overall, two thirds of you are subcontracting and one third of you are, um, are doing your own design. And I'm not surprised there's a split in favor of that. Um, yeah, let's just ask, actually, are any of you currently IB Wave users? I'll just give you a few seconds to uh, to respond to that one. So that's starting to look like 75% uh, are not using and 25% are. Oh, just let that run for a little bit longer. I appreciate everybody I did, responding. I did my design without IB Wave. I started without IB Wave. Uh, uh, doing just Excel and uh, but every time you 
move your antenna or you do anything, you have to recalculate all which was pain. And I was working with uh, Mr. Mario Bouchard. Mario Bouchard is creator of IB Wave, and we work in the same office. And he said, I have to do something about it. And he created that software. <laughs> it's a very useful, but very expensive, fortunately. Okay, let's, uh, let's close that one. Thank you, everybody. So that was 75% uh, in favor of uh, uh, not being a current, uh, not being a current IB Wave user. Uh, just a couple more. Um, it'd be useful to understand what other services you'd like to see us offer in terms of uh, uh, DAS and so on. So uh, it'd be great to see some responses to that one, please. And thanks for everyone for uh, responding so far. It's good engagement here. Thank you. Okay, so no one wants us to do a site survey. That's good because that's tough. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's consulting, 75% there and 25% each for uh, DAS design and, uh, oh, in fact, and, and all of the above. So maybe some people would like us to see us do site surveys. Okay, that's terrific. Thank you very much for that, everyone. That's it's really appreciate. We really appreciate you engaging in, in this way. Um, just two more. Um, this next one is just seeing about whether you'd like to see BDAs as part of the solution that we offer. Let's see where we're going now. Okay. Few people still thinking about that one, but we're um, we're about we're 50/50 at the moment between uh, wanting to uh, to see us offer BDAs and 50% with with no preference. I think it's certainly something that we uh, that we will be considering and uh, and looking into. But that's terrific. So yeah, 50/50 split there about whether we should offer BDAs or not. And then just one final one. Which is just to to measure. These are anonymous, by the way. Um, so if you if the answer is yes, you do have an immediate need, please uh, please do get in touch uh, directly. You do know where to find us. Um, if you have an immediate need, let's let's talk about it. But at the moment, it looks like yeah, um, it's 100 percent. No one's got an immediate need at the moment. But hopefully, um, if we've done nothing else this afternoon. We've raised your awareness that uh, Sinclair's in this game now and uh, ready to uh, to try and help if we can. But at the moment, yeah, good good percentage of people responded now and, and the response is no one's got an immediate requirement, so that's okay. Okay, that's terrific. Um, so, um, Stefan did, uh, did ask if anybody had any questions. Um, if anybody has, uh, has got any questions now, um, please do uh, uh, come up with it. Uh, Okay, yeah, I've, I've lost my window here, but I can see that yes, one person's asking, will we get a recording? And someone else is asking, will we uh, share the recording? Y yes, we have um, we have recorded it. And um, uh, after the webinar, we will we will share that recording with, with not only with everyone that attended, but also everyone that registered. And there were a number of people that, for various reasons, were, uh, were unable to attend. We will pass that, that that out. So yeah, most certainly we'll do that for you. Um, okay, I'll just wait a little longer see if there are any other questions. Looking through a tiny little window here, but uh, no. Okay, that looks as if that's the questions. So um, thank you very much, Stefan. I hope everybody's found it useful. Um, and um, if any questions do occur to you tomorrow, um, you all have my email address. So um, do, do please uh, let me know. And of course, if you have any requirements in the future, um, please, please get in touch and we'll be very pleased to do whatever we can to help you with this. Um, uh, thanks again to, uh, to Stefan. And uh, unless anyone Thank else. Thank you very much for having me. 
And uh, if you have any question, even if it is not related to our product, just shoot the question. I will answer for sure. Yeah, thank you for that, Stefan. Okay, um, uh, just remains to say thanks again for, for attending and hopefully we'll see you at a Sinclair webinar again soon. Thanks very much and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, um, wherever you are. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye.